Yes, thank you. Welcome to you all, also to the panel. Yes, it's a challenge uh, after a session or after a meeting like this, where you all, uh, most of your discussions are in a cell or in a micro uh, um, process uh, of uh, genomes and something like that, to jump on the big level of a system, of healthcare system. And uh, I will introduce uh, why is it so interesting, why is it necessary to discuss this, because I think in oncology, also in some other areas, but in oncology during the last years we have a change of thinking. A change of thinking, what do we understand of cancer development, how is cancer, uh, when cancer starts, that's all new, we, everything is done, we have heard a lot of uh, speaks, uh, talks today, and um, this change is so fundamental that I think a system like the German healthcare system must think about how to react on this change in a big area of cancer care, or care at all. And my first question to all of you, and I will not start with the lady at first, I will start on the left side, is what, <laughs> what is your, your view in future how a system or a healthcare system, everybody of them knows a lot of the system. I don't know how many you know, but what is your Im imagination about what will be done to that the system follows the change in cancer in future? What have we to change? What have we to do that we can go in future also in the healthcare system also, I think, uh, like we now today know in the laboratories, like in uh, the, the hospitals, like you think oncology in, uh, in the Cologne Hospital or somewhere. What must be changed in the system in future so that it fits better what oncology today changed and what must be changed in the system to get it fitted? Now it's working. In, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years from now, it's not really very smart uh, to guess what's happening. I would say then every pan cancer patient will be genotyped somehow, probably whole genome. This information will be used to identify the optimal therapy, whether it is standard chemotherapy, or adjuvant therapy, or immune therapies, or targeted therapies of other kinds. And this will be done in diagnostic and medical centers of some magnitude, because this requires uh, technology, but more importantly, bioinformatical um, tools that will not be available at every hospital, nor at every private practice. It will be a number of selected centers, uh, selected by quality, I would hope, and not by anything else, um, that will provide this important information for the patient. There will be a counseling in probably a molecular tumor board. We heard something about this this morning here at this meeting. That will probably be a standard. Is already some kind of a standard in our center to always introduce the molecular knowledge about the cancer in every single patient to see, well, do we have a point mutation that we can treat and so on. But that will be more systematic in every patient. And then um, after this counseling, the patient will either be treated at the center or at a private practice or a hospital. Which means, which structure do we need at this point? I think a highly networking structure around centers that will, will be organized in regional centers of competence and a network of hospitals, um, regional private oncologists or practices, and of course uh, the surgeons and the, uh, all the other therapies that might eventually still exist like radiotherapy and so on and so forth, but none of them will be able to work alone nor will be any smaller structure uh, be sustainable. I don't think that um, organizations with 10 physicians specialized around cancer are 
will be sufficient to keep all the knowledge or to provide all the necessary knowledge for a single cancer patient. So, in summary, highly complex networking structure that are able to, come to attack the complexity of the clinical problem. You can see the first uh, uh, beginning of this structure? Um, yes, I would say that we uh, have examples of a national structure in France, uh, which is not for, entire cancer, for the entire cancer field, but it is uh, certainly a structure for lung cancer and for cancers where molecular uh, sequencing or sequencing is necessary, where exactly this phenotype is actually uh, played out, and we also try to have a model system of, uh, of this kind in Cologne where we actually serve the region to provide this molecular diagnostics for entire region with uh, now 300 or more than 300 um, health providers in the entire region and across Germany to actually give access to this molecular diagnostics and also to, to distinguish molecular therapies from the still needed uh, more toxic chemotherapies if we don't have any targeted treatment. Okay. Mr. Pfundner, out of the view of... Uh... Yeah, I think it's, uh, first of all, really exciting to look into the future uh, because no one knows what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but there's a few trends that you can see today, and I think they, they are very, very pronounced in oncology. Um, and this is that diagnostics starts playing a very different role. Um, and this is really, you said it, molecular diagnostics, next generation sequencing. So the, the fine print in diagnostics, that's an evolution that will accelerate. And it will be affordable diagnostics in the future. So in 10 years, that diagnostic or 15 years will be very affordable. Now, following that diagnostic um, is always you know, some kind of treatment could be a medical, could be a, a, a pharmaceutical treatment, could be surgery, could be whatever, but it's always a, a, a treatment. And what was missing so far and was only sitting in the brains of a treating physician is what do I do with the diagnostics information and how do I link it to my action? And I think diagnostics will become so complicated and, and so, how we say, yeah, detailed that the question will be, you know, will physicians be capable of um, processing all that information? And therefore, um, I think the technology that is missing um, is the link between diagnostics and making a treatment decision. So actionable health information. And that's where we need data provider. And I think what's really urgently needed, uh, because that's happening in other parts of the wor world, especially in the United States, is a data sharing framework and I think that is that is what you know is needed and I'm sure it will be in place uh, in 10 15 years from now because without a data sharing framework um, there is no information that you can trade and today in Germany we have a very specific situation that it's not clear who owns the patient data is it the hospital? Is it the Krankenkassen? Is it the patient himself? Can we actually turn this data sharing um, into a business? Into a business that, you know, is a business that, you know, sets new standards for the, you know, treatment um, across the world. Um, but what is needed to create this data sharing framework um, and to protect data privacy and respect data privacy laws and so on, that's a real stumbling block that needs to be resolved. But I'm sure in 15 years from now that this will be resolved because it has to be resolved. Thank you. Now we step over a little bit from uh, care near positions to system near positions, uh, Mr. Helfrich. Uh, are sickness funds prepared for the future to react on these models? Uh, uh, Professor Halleck and uh, Mr. Pfundner mentioned uh, what will be do, uh, done in future. Well, well that's the question, what, what, is, what is the purpose of sickness funds? And do we need to be prepared? I, I think it's a society that needs to prepare itself. And it's not only society, it's, it's kind of the global village that needs to prepare itself. And I, I do agree, we will work in networks. And we will have competence and knowledge centers. And we don't know how much IT infrastructure will support decision making in, in, in the near future. 
um, things that seem to be complex now um, might just be something you use a smartphone to do or to, to get a solution to. Um, if you have complex treatment algorithms and, and complex diagnostics, you know, I guess in five years' time you ask someone like Google what to do and he'll give you a sufficient answer. Um, so yes, things will change rapidly. I mean, 15 years ago we didn't even have the internet, you know, just to, to get an idea of what's happening in a rather short period of time. So it will be network structure and, and what we really need is, is really to, uh, to manage this, 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 this vast amount of, of new knowledge, to have a guided pipeline from academic research onto the bedside. And, and yes, sickness funds will have their part in this in this game, but they are not the kind of the, the main player there. Yeah. But you're, uh, I think, a sickness fund, nearly six million people in there. Yeah. Do you discuss in your group what they try to have in future? What their what their aims are as uh, members of your sickness fund want in future? Do you discuss this? Y yes, we do, but. Uh, to say members of our insurers of our sickness fund, we have to say that 80% of them don't care about sickness at all because they're healthy. Yeah? So, so um, most of the insurers are basically healthy and that's why they don't know anything about Obama's medicine because they're not, not yet, you know, they don't have anything, they don't need medicine. But yes, and, and we do start this together with, with other sickness funds. I mean, we have, it's not very polite to say that in Heidelberg, but we, we, we start something on, on breast and ovarian cancer. We have a competence center in Cologne where we work with, with one center that kind of does the diagnostic testing and is, has all the cleverness and then kind of um, puts it into a network of satellites. And we do the same as lung cancer, again, not Heidelberg, but um, it's Bonn. Um, so yes, we, we do start to, to, to kind of uh, start with these um, structures to, to have competence centers. And it's different centers for different diseases. So it's not just like one center that does it all, but it's a different centers it's spread all over the world or the country um, that have, to f have different competence profiles. <coughs> That's fine. You are a part of this development, but it's interesting uh, all to Professor Schmiegel. Uh, no, it's just him. <laughs> you don't want. <laughs> I don't, I don't think ladies first only, but I think that there's another view of, uh, I, I call you better health insurance company than sickness fund. Sickness fund uh, is perhaps uh, established, but uh, health insurance sounds a little bit better. But you can continue uh, to give your view before I have uh, anybody else. Okay, then she starts, then follow. Of all? Yeah, that's, no, it, it works. First of all, I'd uh, um, apologize for my bad English because uh, normally in our health insurances we speak German. So uh, my time in school, it's been a long time ago, so I, I try. Yes. <laughs> um, I think um, what uh, Mr. Helfrich had said, um, it's uh, we need the discussion uh, in the society, not only in the health insurance. We, we have a discussion between medicine and the uh, uh, aims of, of medicine and uh, the uh, economic side. And I think uh, it's necessary to talk uh, to this in the, uh, in the society, not only in the insurance, because uh, the insurances, um, the, the politic uh, wants that um, our insurances is in, uh, in a battle, in a battle situation. Yeah? And normally, um, we, we try that our, um, that our um, members had to pay only a low, uh, a low level yeah, for, for payment. Um, but when we, um, when we know what's about the, the innovations in, in, in uh, oncology, we know that uh, our price will, will uh, get off. Yeah? So we had the discussion in our society what are our aims in medicine, and what's about the other uh, the other illnesses, uh, for example, diabetes, yeah, and uh, what's about acupuncture and and uh, other wellness medicine, yeah? uh, That's the discussion we had to talk and uh, we had to to uh, get off in in the society. But uh, I think the AK and Bamar Azatskasse. Together, you are, I Bama think, Bama GEK. Bama GEK, sorry, <laughs> I'm in the old world. <laughs> yeah. But uh, together, you are more than 10% more than 15% of society. 
You are society. You have to discuss. Yeah, we, we have Not this. anywhere. Therefore, yeah. I think my question was, are you in your desire yeah. to discuss to make a balance between the people who are healthy and the people who are sick? Um, I think um, um, we tried to discuss this and we need more uh, communication. Um, we have the, the health insurances is one, one world. It's another world in the, in the medicine. Normally, the health insurances don't speak with physicians. Yeah? Normally, there are... We would understand. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think so. Uh, but normally, there is no, no uh, panel for discussion. Okay. Yeah? We, we, the, the health insurances is only the payment. We had to pay and we had... Uh, to to, yeah, we had, we had this silence and we had, don't lose uh, any words. But I think this isn't, the, the, this will be, uh, um, no, this, this won't be the, the future. Oh. Yeah? My question, therefore, I said, between uh, Mr. Helfrich told about there's Cologne, there's Heidelberg, uh, you're coming from Bochum and you have not a chance to do all these things. Uh, is that good for the people in Bochum in future? Would, uh, I would have a look at it at a different site. Actually, we can not do the entire spectrum Cologne has already established, but we are on the track. But what uh, worries me even more is, at first, the self-definition of our insurance companies. They pretend to sit on the passenger seat and not on the driver's seat. I actually regard them as caretakers of their customers. And as caretakers, they have to be part of the driving seat and cannot say, yeah, we do watchful waiting, but the uh, politics and the society and all the nice people around us actually will do. That's uh, too defensive. You are, you are part of uh, the game and you are one of the lead players. That's my personal and society opinion. The second is personalized, individualized, precision medicine, oncology 4.0, these are, these are issues having been uh, key uh, uh, topics through uh, medical conferences uh, the last 10 years. And we have developed that. We have progressed. But n now looking uh, uh, how it enters reality, we have to face a cancer gap. Not only in Germany, also in the US. In the US we have 1.6 million new cancer uh, diagnoses every year and only 5% of the afflicted individuals are really being treated according to personalized or precision medicine. And in Germany, I fear these are even less. So we have, we have a concept, we have the diagnostic tools, we have uh, uh, specific drugs, and we have to work on concepts to bring this to reality. Actually, we are responsible for an unmet promise. We have promised throughout years to all the people, and particularly to the patients, that we are working on pre precision medicine. And uh, actually, I, I, I wonder why they do not ask, where is it? Where is the beef? Yes, but they keep, keep silent, but not, for, for, not forever. So we, we are in charge to develop concepts. We are in charge to identify qualified institutions. We are in charge to have a permanent dialogue. This dialogue is not in the, uh, in, uh, in the general assembly in the Allgemeinen Bundesausschuss. This is more a slow down element, but uh, not a catalyzator. It's not in the EQIC and not in the EQTIC and all these new developments po the politicians actually invent to keep our attention away. Uh, this has to be in a discussion, a very intensive discussions between those who are competent in the field from the scientific from the medical, from the insurance level. And we have to find concepts to bring this medicine to people. People have, an, have a right, because it's the society uh, which has paid all our scientific work, and they have a right to be paid back. And we are, we are clearly in the situation where we have to fulfill a long given promise. May, may, may I ask you, all of you maybe, but whoever wants, as Mr. Schmiegel said, there is no doubt about the innovation potential of the precision medicine, innovative, personalized medicine, whatever. But there is 
also in discussion also since a couple of years, the discussion about the, eff the, eff the efficacy of, of that process, the question of costs. And this is why, are you, why you are sitting here. Because we need to tackle the question of cost. And this is a social question, really. This is a societal question, how to handle in future the cost. Because as you told us already, there are just a few who are who are uh, who, who who get these new therapies so far, and even those who get these new therapies, as Mr. Halleck this morning told us, there is a doubt what it will cost in the future. Maybe maybe we can we can uh, really heal the patients, or we can cure it at all, or we have to to pay for 10 years or 20 years for the patients. And that will be very expensive, of course, for society. And this is what a lot of people, including politicians, are asking right now in this situation. And maybe you should answer, get them an answer, uh, give them an answer. Uh, what will be the development on that field, on the, on the cost side, and the efficacy of that process? Maybe Mr. Pfundner starts. Yeah, happy, happy to do so. Um, I think we need to look at a few facts. Um, and this is when we talk about what's the societal willingness to pay for health. Um, this is determined via elections and political programs. In 1995, the percentage of healthcare expenditure to our GDP, so our gross domestic product, was 9.5%. So we spent 95 of our economic power um, on healthcare. Today, 2014, it's 11%. So one and a half percentage increase over a period of 20, 25 years. Um, about 25 years ago, and I was asked just outside, everyone said, the healthcare cost will explode. HIV AIDS. This is gonna kill society, this will explode. Now we managed HIV AIDS, um, and the costs of the medical treatment and the diagnostics, what have you, was expensive at the time. Today, no one is talking about treatment costs, treating HIV AIDS. Actually, it has become a chronic disease. You're no longer dying from HIV AIDS. You can be treated. There's, there's parts of the world where this is different, but they also die from uh, malnutrition and, and bad water. Um, but the point here is, that was an innovation wave. And everyone in German, and I would call it the German angst, said this innovation wave will kill us and will you know, overpower the system. Um, then we had cardiovascular diseases, we had infectious diseases, we had you know, lots of things more. At the same time, every time we have innovation, innovation is followed by imitation. When I look at pharmaceuticals. So you have innovative products, then you have generic products. Today, the innovation really takes place in oncology. It's a dramatic technology um, evolution and, and partially even a revolution if we now think about immunotherapy. And everyone is centering around what's happening in oncology. You know, and you look at individual cost of medication, but also fact is, and I looked it up, 2014 and 2015, the pharmaceutical market is growing altogether, the German pharmaceutical market, by about five to six percent. Oncology is growing by five to six percent. That's facts, these are facts. So where is the panic? Where is the, 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 the reason for panicking today? Now what we should be looking at moving forward, anticipating the future, is will the evolution and revolution and innovations in oncology overpower the system? So I think it's worthwhile carefully analyzing and looking at trends. And I can tell you the most, um, I say the biggest products currently today being used for treating uh, malignancies half come off patent or will become off patent in the next three years. That means, again, that will leave headroom for new innovations. And I can tell you in about 20 years, 10, 20 years, my personal prediction is looking at the disease areas that I have looked at over the past few years, will it come in cycles, oncology will not be the major um, cost buster. It will be an affordable treatment. 
but we need to withstand these pressures at times and look at the total, um, you know, whatever treatment uh, paradigm, whether it's cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, where are the costs really coming from, and not isolating an area where we really, really have the opportunity, perhaps in 10 years, to cure a few cancers that we can't cure today. And that's the price we have to pay, the price for innovation then being followed by imitation. So you think it's too early to start uh, to discuss uh, the costs of, of the therapies? Maybe one should talk about innovation and about new opportunities, new chances, of course. Yes, maybe you know. I guess, I guess pricing is always a part of our daily life. And this discussion should be uh, run on a really solid, on a solid basis. That means we need, what we, are, uh, we need to know what we are paying for. Uh, I think that uh, transparency is a, a, a key element uh, to uh, get the data soberly analyzed and uh, there must be a free access for the insurance companies to analyze the data. But, but, we, but we need a responsibility that is shared by all key players. A single party cannot realize the new deal with pre precision medicine. Yeah? We are all in the same bus, not everybody at the same time on the driver's seat, but nearly as. Can I just, just say, it's, it's going to be a bit difficult for people from outside Germany, because I mean, the attempt to explain the German healthcare system in, in a nutshell it, it won't work. It's, it's, it's rather difficult. So, yes, I, I do agree. Costs will come down, and I do disagree. It's, it's not the sickness funds, and they are not companies. Um, as they don't pay taxes, as they are kind of deferred governmental bodies. Again, not trying to explain the system, but um, we have very restricted rules and basically we work for the government. So that's, that's something that's, that's fairly different. And we are not the society. We are our insurers because, for instance, civil servants are, are not in, in sickness funds. So that's something that's, that's very different. Um, I think things will get cheaper, and this this kind of cost busting or up rising rising costs is, is is nothing that's kind of exclusively for for oncology. Wherever you sit, you sit with rheumatologists, you sit with cardiovascular guys. Wherever you sit, they all think they are kind of the spearhead of evolution. They are not. Um, this is something that goes through medicine as a whole. Things are getting more sophisticated wherever you look, and. Um, prices will come down. Yes, sickness funds, to, to answer you, um, they will have a part in kind of f forming the system, but I think the main part is, is about physicians deciding which medicine is the right medicine to do. And um, guidelines cannot, and, and, and physicians don't really want that, cannot be made by, by insurance companies or sickness funds. Guidelines have to be made by clinicians. They have to, to find an agreement on how best to treat which disease. And, and that's the real difficulty, because they cannot agree, um, having all their kind of little centers. So if they have a guideline, we, are, we have to pay it. That, that's the way it works, and it's fine. It works fine that way. And with, with respect to costs, um, when costs hit the roof, society does find an answer. Um, as pharmaceutical companies know, in 2009 there was the AMLOC process, um, where this, this kind of free pricing for pharmaceuticals found an end. So if you put too much strain on, 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 on the society or, or the state, then they will find an answer to cut these costs. Oh, wow. Well. Thank you very much for this optimistic view. But of course, we will have some, some comments here and maybe questions also. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm quite happy to uh, have representatives from the healthcare system here because this is actually one of the worries I always have when I uh, see all this very exciting uh, news that um, at some point it might not be all patients that benefit from these uh, peak innovations. And I think that's, uh, especially with the new technologies, that should be uh, and must be a factor that uh, yeah, should be accounted for. I mean, uh, look at a, a PD-1 antibody. It's much more expensive than the uh, standard of care uh, therapy was before, but it's so much more effective that eventually it will pay off, I mean, besides all the ethical aspects, obviously. 
but uh, these these calculations must be made, and uh, I think we should be honest enough to uh, deal with that. Thank you very much. Yes, very important question about the benefits. Because you, you mentioned PD-1 antibodies, immunotherapy, and I just, because we're in this field, uh, looked it up, uh, dermato-oncology. Uh, within three months, the German system, there's two products, two PD-1 uh, compounds in the market. Within three months, 60% of all patients were treated with these new products. 60%. That's a penetration that you, I don't think, find anywhere in the world. How much, did, how much did you earn from that, from, this, from these patients? Tell, tell us the number. How much did you earn from that patient? I, I just give you, per patient, how much is it? What about? So we need some numbers. I, I'm the press, you know. Yeah, you know, but I, I'm a, how, how much do we earn? Um, I don't know what, whether this How much question, did it cost the, the, per patient? The, 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 yeah, it's, it's difficult. The treatment um, is... You know, again, it's the German system, and there is uh, currently in ne negotiations um, what the final price will be. Sorry, that is someone who is telling me not to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> and ask them who paid it, who, and ask them who paid for it, <laughs> uh, please. <laughs> let's, let's put it this way: the um, depending on how depending on how long you treat, depending on how long you treat, the annual treatment cost of these new therapies are in the amount of 60 to 80 thousand euros. And that's before they have finally been negotiated with the, with the, with the statutory health insurance. Now, um, what I wanted to say is because your point was they should, you know, it should be accessible to everyone in need. Now, about specifically malignant melanoma, where these innovations took place, about five, six years ago, there was no treatment whatsoever. No treatment. There was dacarbazine, which was recommended not to be you know, used in malignant melanoma. Now we have BRAF inhibitors, targeted therapies for people with specific mutations, and we have the new treatments. 100% of the market is with new treatments. Um, all I'm saying is the access scheme, and I have worked in different countries. I worked in Canada, I worked in the United States, I worked in Switzerland, I worked in Sweden. And every time I say Sweden, everyone starts crying, especially our former health minister, uh, Ulla Schmidt, because she said it's such a wonderful country and they're treating everyone well. These types of penetrations and access to innovation, you hardly find in any other country. And I think that's worthwhile protecting. And the Krankenkassen are not paying for this, and the physicians prescribing. And we earning good money with this. Um, the point is we have no interest in overpowering the system ourselves, to be very frank, because our income comes from the health insurance companies. 90% of our revenues coming from the statutory health insurance system. If the statutory health insurance system has no money, we have no business. So it's a, it's a, it's a catch-22. Are they too expensive? How much do we earn? Who, who decides? Who has the right to say we're making too much profit or not enough profit? That's a very different question. But access to medicine in Germany is still a very, very, um, I would say, um, fortunate situation. So everybody could benefit from that new therapies in, in, this, this, year, in this particular case. OK, Mr. Halling. So, um, to just uh, comment on your important point, and I think that's the overall point of the first round of discussion anyway, as I said this morning, we should, as physicians and researchers, worry that the treatment works and find treatments that function. Uh, we find therapeutic principles that really change the clinical curse of a cancer, let's say melanoma. And actually some of them are still not there yet, and maybe therefore overpriced, yes, because they are not good enough. And, but the, the first question should be efficacy and how can we give it to all our patients. I totally agree with you that every patient should get the treatment, the, the optimal treatment, so that when there is a limit, let's say the prices are overpowering the system, as we said, we have to act politically as a society, we as citizens, the patients, the patient associations to correct the pricing. That's our responsibility. If we feel that the society is spending too much on things that are not worth it. And I think that's the second question. And very often, and that's one of the things that I, what, that's why I take the comment, very often in Germany, the first question is, 
well, innovation is bad because it may cost too much. And I think that's very, that can be dangerous, and therefore I actually comment on this one more time. Uh, and finally, uh, as a comment in two more comments in general, I think we also can be better in many regards because we waste in the healthcare system. So while there are some essential treatments in cancer patients that are badly needed and should be given to every patient that needs it, uh, our system is prone to tremendous waste. And so therefore I created of, or brought the American initi Initiative Choosing Wisely in the, into Germany because if you look into certain areas, there is an overuse of medical technologies that is not needed. It doesn't do any benefit to anyone. And so we can save on things that are not necessary to give it to, for instance, cancer patients or badly ill patients that require treatment. We, as physicians, we have a responsibility to select the procedures according to the real benefit to the patient. And that's something that is very often not done. Um, and so I'm relatively optimistic that our system has lots of internal resources also uh, to uh, to provide all these things. And then one last thing, because I was a little worried to hear about your comment, having Google replacing the decision-making process, or let's say Apple, or I mean, I know that they are all now at American conferences. And this is actually a worrisome uh, development to me because the patient will always need uh, somebody in between uh, in whom he can trust. And we will, we would, to the healthcare system a very bad service if we could really believe uh, that you can replace the human aspect by algorithms that you can find on the computer as a cancer patient, like type in your sequence and then you get your treatment from the box and so on. I don't think that this uh, will work and we should not encourage to invent something like this. Thank you very much, Mr. Halleck. There is a remark from Mr. Keller, maybe, and then we... Yes, of course. Just to, to, to kind of clarify, this was a gross misunderstanding. I'm not saying everybody should put in his kind of health data into Google and then get, get his diagnosis from a computer. But um, knowledge management it will be difficult enough for physicians to then access, you know, the, the best knowledge available at the time via something like, you know, Google, whatever. That, that was what I meant. Thank you. Mr. Kahn. Yeah, just a short comment. To, to my understanding, there is no legal... Um, precedent in Germany or no legal reason to withhold um, the better treatment from patients for any reason and that includes cost. I don't think anybody here, the press, um, the, the health insurance companies, the doctors have any legal justification to withhold the better treatment um, from any patient. But the point is what Mr. Halleck said, if, if it is wasted, the money, of course, one should interrupt so this is what the public's uh, uh, concerns are, or the public concern is not about the cost. Of course, if you're curing people, of course, there is no question, there's no doubt, we, we of course, everybody will, but, will, but will I, agree. I would, but I would like to support Michael Halleck. The, the doctors should decide what's the best treatment. The economists should decide what's the best price. And the health insurances should should you know, you know negotiate yes. with the companies <laughs> on, on the price. And we are also defensive. Yeah. So you we have here some always some at the same time. <laughs> yes. Some more contributions from you or both? Maybe you, ladies first. Yes. Um, it's, it's my opinion. Uh, it, it's necessary that uh, we have a look at the overtreatment. Um, when we have the discussion, for example, for the uh, NGS. Uh, the NGS is a new technology uh, who, um, who is not impossible, uh, who's impossible to pay from, a, from the health insurance. It, uh, the NGS, it isn't in the catalog. We, we don't pay it. We, we can't pay it, so I, it's necessary to, to say. Also, we have the uh, system discussion for NGS with the for example, with the KBV, Kassenärztliche Bundesvereinigung. It's the, uh, it's the head uh, um, quarter of the uh, physicians. So uh, the, um, the discussion is NGS for Morbus Meulengracht. Morbus Meulengracht is a simple, simple liver disease with yellow eyes. 
And I said, we need no NGS for Morbus Meulengracht. And this is the discussion between medicine and overtreatment. I think, uh, and uh, Mr. Halleck, uh, he, he smiles, huh? uh, I think uh, we need no NGS for Morbus Meulengracht. And so it's necessary that we, uh, we had this economic um, discussion and the medicine discussion in the in the same uh, strength um, for the, the treatment for the patient. It's necessary that our uh, patients and all the patients fr uh, from every uh, health insurance had the best treatment, but it's necessary that we have a look for the over-treatment. Yeah? So, thank you very much. Now we have a final round, I guess. Uh, Maybe Mr. Schmiegel, he wants also to comment yeah, on that? Well, I, I, I share your view, but yeah. by the way, Moyengracht is not only yellow eyes. Moyengracht can be critical if you administer chemotherapeutics like irinotecane, because yeah. Moyengracht is, a, uh, is an enzyme defect with a uh, slowed down transcriptional activity, and that is also critical for detoxification of uh, drugs like uh, chemotherapeuticals. Uh, so I would assume NGS for Moyengracht not in everybody's hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? But sometimes it can make sense and it should be, all these things we are talking about should be in, in qualified centers. But, yeah, and we are expanding, we are expanding our um, uh, approach with the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary tumor boards we now need also molecular tumor boards. And that is uh, uh, a new way that cannot be established in every clinic in Germany. And, and this and, is and, that and I say, we, we, uh, it's necessary that we have the uh, discussion. Yes, yeah? Yeah? yes I, 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 I invite you to, to take the driver's seat. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, you too. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, so we need specialized centers to carry out this uh, new approach, to bring this approach really to the people. And what we also need is to get people informed, because actually they decide that the, 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 the decision making in daily life is entirely different. They go to the clinic their GP advises them to go to, and not to the clinic which is really qualified. Uh, uh, and we cannot force them to do so, but we have to convince them that if they want uh, 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 an adequate uh, therapy, a modern therapy, a precision uh, uh, medicine, they have to move. Uh, they don't find it around the corner. They have to, they have to move, and many people don't like to move. Huh? They, they like to stay at home and to have the clinic uh, within reach. Uh, but you cannot get all of it. You cannot have the cake and eat it. So we have to, to inform people about new possibilities. We are heavily encouraged by this session this evening by the sickness funds <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> as, as partnering, OK? OK. We start this discussion with the view in the future. We end with the view in the future. And I would uh, ask everybody, if we said, OK, we have a lot of innovation in oncology, everybody accepted this in the discussion. Uh, uh, do we have or do we need innovation in system to, to get oncology in future running better? First question, do we need uh, innovation in system? And the second, which innovation? You can start. Um, we, we need innovation in system. A system a, a innovation. A system innovation, yeah. yeah. Um, for example, we, we need the, uh, um, the new rules for the studies. Uh, we we uh, talked about this at uh, the biomarker for breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer and the biomarker for breast cancer, it isn't a, a medicine. It's a new therapy in, in the... Uh, um, Leistungsrecht in, in our, in our uh, point of view. Yeah? It isn't a medicine, it's a new therapy. So it's necessary for us that we have, um, um, that we have uh, possibility to pay this quality. And so uh, we had the, the quality discussion. We had the, it's necessary that we have the um, structure discussion for in the hospitals. Yeah? And it's also necessary that we have the discussion for our structures uh, in, in, a, um, 
between our uh, health insurances. And uh, Mr. Helfrich and, and uh, others, we have a, um, we have a discussion panel, uh, uh, especially uh, from the medicine side, uh, in our health and insurance system, uh, so that we, we want to be the drivers in the, <laughs> in the seats, but uh, our rules, they are very, we are, we are a big uh, ship, yeah? and it, it's, it's very hard uh, when we want to turn at the right side. But it's good to hear that also you want to change the system. Yeah. Professor Schmiegel, do we need change in system? I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need a change. Actually, actually this year, uh, our uh, the Ministry of Health has launched uh, a couple of new laws. Uh, covering many, many different aspects of our health system. What we are, now, what we are lacking now is to, to focus their attention to the needs of a molecular-based approach. And we are talking about can cancer therapy, but the, this can easily be expanded to other areas in medicine as well. So, so we need the politicians. And actually, uh, you, when, I, when I look at your self-definition, you, you are suffering under these politicians which keep you on a very short leash. But actually, when we talk about the politicians, they always say, these insurance companies guys are so crazy with us. Huh? They always, they're always making us mad. Huh? So uh, we will find out who's really uh, the key player, OK? Do we need change? Which one? Yeah, but I won't, wouldn't let you off that, that easily. Because medicine in itself is, is quite easy. You just have to get the right treatment to the right patient. And in order to do so, I think what you really need is, is, is consensus within the medical community. And this is where we wouldn't let them off. Because it's, it's not about sickness funds or, or government. It's about doctors finding a consensus and doctors defining the right treatment for, the, for whatever disease there is. And then it's not us kind of interfering with it, but that is a process that is very difficult in proving that this therapy is efficacious. And with respect to innovation, yes, as I said before, we need a guided pipeline through, say, comprehensive innovation centers. And that does mean that there's one institution that does all the innovation, but very various centers that care for one or for each innovation um, to, to get it guided into kind of the, the, the bedside um, treatment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fundner. Yeah, we absolutely uh, need a, a system revolution. Um, this is, now think about how insane this is. We paid for the past 20, 30 years for drugs that have an effi uh, efficacy range of about 20%. It's like going into a lottery. And that is what the system paid for for 20 years and is still paying for today. Now we have, you know, when you specifically look at oncology, we're at the verge of moving into an area where we're reaching a 60, 70, 80, 90 percent um, efficacy rate for any given treated patient. Um, so what I learned over the last few years being in this industry and being in the healthcare environment is what gets paid for gets done. That might not, not sound sexy, and not everyone might like this, especially not researchers. But fact is, if we don't change the reward mechanism of what gets, do gets done, um, and we incentivize it properly, and we just heard about biomarkers that needed to be implemented, next generation sequencing, it's not that no one can pay and afford next generation sequencing, but if the treating pathologist take the first patient that comes in and sequence the entire genome, and that costs whatever, two and a half, three thousand euros, then you can't afford it. So what we need to do is really a complete system overhaul to counter and care for precision medicine. Um, and oncology could be a specific case in point where one could test it. The example, yes. Mr. Halley. So I would <clears throat> agree with... Uh with most of what has been said, and like to add only two aspects. Number one, um, I would argue that uh, physicians in the system need to find and define a place where economy is not driving what you do. So we have too long now defined medicine by procedures, diagnostic procedures, therapies, 
And what really counts for the patient is that he's really taken care of in the most universal sense that you can imagine. And it is exactly this that is in our system not rewarded. If you have a pathology test of some kind, and we are discussing the numbers, 2,000 euros. But to actually take care of a patient in the true sense, and a cancer patient needs that, is basically not, not rewarded in the system. And I'm not talking for any new system to actually reimburse that, but to really change our thinking and try to, to find and to, well, be responsible as physicians, and maybe then that, that might require a change in system, yes. And to only be driven by the fact that you seek the optimal therapy for the patient, whatever it takes, and sometimes it doesn't take a lot. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost anything, and sometimes it's expensive. But this notion of economy-driven medicine to deliver in hospitals, in oncology, is a business now, uh, can mislead, and it, it needs to be rethought, because the the, most, the highest value for the patient is that uh, being actually enveloped in an environment where he actually can re be re fall down a bit and be taken care of. And I think there's a total misdirection in the reimbursement system that needs to be corrected. Uh, and finally, I would say clinical research in Germany and pharmaceutical development in Germany needs to be strengthened. Otherwise, we will import everything from the Americas or from other countries, and I don't think that this should be our long-lasting ambition to be the benefiter of uh, pharmaceutical imports. We should try to really, really develop our own strength in our own country again to contribute and to control the efficacy. I mean, basically to control the value or the, the efficacy of the drugs once they are on the market. And for this, we totally need to redefine the value of clinical research in Germany to have a better system to do clinical trials to control what's done after approval. Okay, thank you. 60 minutes are over. I think we are not at the end, but we can finish now. Um, I see all are on the way in the, in the right direction, in the same direction, but the velocity is quite different. And I would say uh, this discussion will be hold on, I think, the next years. I think we have to do some changes. Uh, and I think the power of innovation in college will drive the system to change. I, that's my hope. And uh, I think that's what we can do for the best uh, for the patient. And therefore, I thank the audience, the panel, to be here. I gave over now to make the last, last word uh, to my colleague and uh, come good at home. And uh, at the last, 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 then, uh, Get over there. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Yeah, from, from, from my view, it was a rather optimistic view, uh, concluding remarks which hold a lot of promise. Uh, and that's pretty, pretty interesting to hear and nice to hear. Thank you very much for, for the audience to take part, of course, in the evening. And then I, uh, this is the point where I have to hand it over to, to Mr. Kammer.